Que era o Coto Catoa? Tonga Rewa, que é agora Frank, que é agora Internet New Zealand. For those of you uh, who need this in English, uh, I will be giving the entire lecture in Maori, but there will be this <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, it's good to be here in New Zealand. This is my first time in New Zealand. Uh, so I, uh, that of course is changed. You'll only be here for uh, a day. However, we will be one of the few people in the world who go away with this fixed idea uh, of Wellington as being a place based on a new <laughs> So uh, it's an interesting time to be talking about these things. Uh, I've been asked to talk about open. One of the things that happens as I, when I'm talking to journalists, for example, is they have more than one occasion on this talk even to turn to me and say, so, you want the whole world to be just open? And I think, so then we have to go back, well, what do you mean by open? So I've been asked to elaborate, about, talk about open. Now, each of these aspects of openness, I am quite prepared to, and have often talked for 45 minutes about, and I'm going to go, go over sort of eight or nine of them. So we'll have to be very much of a, of a top level thing. I will try to keep it at the top level. Uh, apologies in advance if I end up going too deep on each of them. Uh, but there will be, hopefully, if I manage this, and uh, there will be time for questions afterwards, if I can uh, zoom through this. So, I suppose, to put things in perspective, it's worth just going back uh, to explain where I'm coming from. I suppose that back, as uh, Frank was saying, yes, 1969 was when Vince Surf and Co. invented the internet. They invented the system of sending packets like little postcards but between computers like postcards go between post offices so that you could write a program on one computer and it communicate with the program on another computer anywhere in the world. So by 20 years later, it's 1989, that's very different, very different music, like great both, uh, both great years of music in different ways. Uh, 1989, uh, I wrote a memo about the World Wide Web. Uh, that actually not a lot of people. History does not really record that. I did that in, Mar in uh, March. In uh, summer, Solidarity uh, took over, uh, overturned the, the re regime, and in the fall, the Berlin Wall went down. So that was uh, that was just a photo. That's what 1989. All of what the news was full of in 1989. And I wrote a memo, nobody took any notice of it. Not because of the burning wall, but because I was working in this really cool lab where the, word, where, where the mandate was to do physics. And this, and this is for a software system, an internet-based hypermedia system. And uh, people, I've been working at, talking about this at sort of, uh, in spare time, over coffee, uh, coffee and, uh, uh, and drinks and time, and kind of like that, into people. But, there was, uh, I hadn't, there was no real way that I could progress it because it wasn't a software company. Uh, I was there as a software engineer to help physicists put everything together, and the uh, and so in fact uh, uh, nothing happened for all, all that year. Next year, about the same time, I was talking to somebody about it, and they said, "Why don't you write? Uh, you should write a memo about that." And I said, "Well." I, did. So, oh, you should have sent it to me. I said, well, I think I did. <laughs> so, what's it again? So, uh, I sent it off to the same set of people uh, with a date on the top, with a date just to rub it in March 1989, comma, May 1990. Uh, and uh, sent it around again, nothing happened. But, as it happens, my boss was a really nice guy. And not only he's very bright, uh, he, uh, and he let me basically. Uh, buy a computer and spend the time from uh, when I bought this machine, which was the next machine, which was a very cool machine, the thing that Steve Jobs uh, produced when he left Apple. Uh, he let, let me just try the machine out by seeing how easy it was to write a program for it. He said, what you say you'll need to sell, to test, to try out this box with uh, the next box with some kind of machine, some sort of kind of program sort of to test it with, what, what could be used? How about that hypertext thing you were talking about? Mike died uh, 10 years later, and when he went through his things, they found a copy of that memo. And in the corner, in Mike's handwriting in, in uh, pencil, it said, uh, vague but exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, 
if he had said perhaps to himself, exciting but vague, we'd have no world wide web. So, um, <laughs> so, so, but there you are, that is, because people ask you how innovation happens, it happens through people being allowed to do stuff. Um, the next box was a great machine, it took me about two, uh, two months, but I had, it, had, uh, had the thing working uh, by, uh, by about the middle of November. Um, so that was 1990. And the history after that is a little bit like, I don't know, have you got anybody in the audience who has ever been on a, in a bobsled? <laughs> we have one. Okay. <laughs> I have. But I'd imagine this is what it's like but when you're in the bobsled, you have to, you have to uh, push. When it starts off, it's really heavy. You have to get a lot of people, you have to get a lot of people, everybody in a team has to push the thing along, right? And then it picks up speed, and then there is a critical point, it looks, when you watch it on TV, that from pushing, it's the, it starts to pick up speed, and at the same time, the hill starts to pick up. And at that point, you have to get in and steer. You have to switch mode. And for the World Wide Web, the switching mode was a, yeah, I realized that, that it was going to be necessary around 1992, started talking to people about what I should do around 1993. In 1994, uh, uh, with the aid of MIT, we started the World Wide Web Consortium, and that's where, and I'm still the director of that, that's where HTML5 is being produced. We started off with the uh, Maya, so more or less written on the back of an envelope, specifications for HTML, didn't even have a number, and now, uh, and it's been running ever since, and you can go there at w3.org and see what's going on. So that is, you know, that was the start, that was um, the, and uh, everything, you know, which you see out there on the web is basically based on, the, on, the, on those, uh, uh, those specs, and so when you, uh, and the, uh, and the great thing about it, I suppose, partly was I developed it completely by myself, so I didn't have to ask, talk to anybody else. After that, it was all about talking to people, and talking to people slows you down a lot. So one of the things, when you meet people that's worked on standards, you realize that a person's made a great sacrifice of working at the speed of getting consensus and, uh, and persuading other people to come along. So, uh, now, so the thing started as, uh, as an open system. A crucial question was asked sort of early on when there was a competing system called Gopher, where produced by the University of Minnesota, the University of Minnesota said they might possibly charge for it in the future, and everybody dropped it like a ton of bricks. Came to me and said, "Look, we don't want to work with. We are effectively we want to write. Don't we, want to write we don't want to write code just for the University of Minnesota. Effectively, uh, what's going to happen with the web? What, what, uh, what about CERN? And in fact." Robert Caillou, my colleague, and I had been trying to bug the CERN management to make sure that they would commit to not charge all of this for it. And after 18 months of trying, we actually did 30th April, was it 19? Uh, uh, forget, uh, forget exactly when it was that they, but they, but they uh, actually stamped, the director, the one director of the CERN actually wrote and signed and stamped. CERN will not charge any royalties for the World Web Technology, and that was absolutely key. And that, without that, it would not have taken off. So, in a way, that was, and in some, in some people, that's one aspect of uh, openness. Let me talk about lots of openness. I'm going to talk about open standards, I'm going to talk about open source, I'm going to talk about open access, I'm going to talk about open government a little bit, I'm going to talk about the open web platform quite a lot, and I'm going to talk about open data, uh, and I'm going to talk about the open internet and the open web. But isn't that an awful lot of different ways in which people use the word open? So, uh, and we have a limited amount of time, but, the, but we're really talking about the consortium, we're really talking about people coming together in working groups. Open, uh, the open standards, uh, people do sometimes misuse that word. In fact, it's been misused so much recently that a bunch of people, W3C, the IEEE, the Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, and others got together to uh, create something that you can Google under open standards. If you look for open stand, you will find that there, uh, there is a declaration uh, that, uh, of some basic principles. That, uh, for example, if you're developing what we call, if you, to call it an open standard, then everybody has to be a well, One thing, you shouldn't have to pay money to buy a paper copy of the standard. You know, the ISO specs, which we were all used to before that, you have to pay a significant amount of money, sometimes a, a prohibitive amount of money for a small company to actually just buy a standard itself because ISO funds itself 
by charging for the stamp. So it works out that these stamps are actually a sort of a commodity uh, which they should charge for by the kilo. Uh, so now we always got over the web, you know, well, we put some things on the web for free, but also we try to make those processes so that you can get the people uh, who are really care about it, know a lot about it, involved in the working group, but also anybody else can review it. And so the process, that you make a process which is a well-defined process, where you know, everybody can read what the process is, see how they can get involved. So, uh, and in the, in the WCC, after a horrible uh, ex experience with somebody who tried to join a wo working group and then immediately start ch charging people royalties, somebody who didn't get, didn't come with this ethos of royalty free built into their heads, then we, we formalized that. So WCC, has adopted a royalty-free patent policy. So as the standard becomes defined, as it goes through the WTC, as it becomes more tested, as it becomes more refined, at the same time, it gets more, a stronger and stronger commitment of the participating companies and individuals to not charge royalties. They can have patents all over the public as but they just aren't allowed to charge royalties. So from WTC's point of view, uh, the open standards involves royalty-free. The rest of the open stand people, uh, they were, most of the other organizations out there, are they allow RAND, uh, that, that is a reasonable non-discriminatory terms, or FRAND, sort of reasonable non-discriminatory terms where the cost is zero but you have to get a license from us, things like that, things which we all, uh, we feel are, are inappropriate. Um, one of the, the whole, uh, there, there are lots of interesting Issues to do with the design of standards, uh, uh, standards consortia. Uh, one of the one of the things we have is that, uh, which is unusual, is that unlike most standards, you have maybe 12 people in the group, uh, actively in the group, of which six are actually doing most of the arguing, and two or three are doing the writing, and uh, one person's chairing. But then you have a spec like HTML, and almost everybody out there seems to have an idea about a tag that should be in it. <laughs> and some of them may email me personally with their ideas for tags, which is not a stupid idea, but you know, but, but they, and, and so the HTML working group has had to have a much bigger process of systems of, uh, of uh, in a way, it's had to ironically become more bu bureaucratic, because it's had to defend itself against just the size of the population which is interested in it. And the, working, the group working group itself is much larger, hundreds of people in it, and, and so on. So really, one of the things we learned is that you have to be able to, to some extent, design the standards process uh, on a specific thing. You have to be able to tailor it, use different tools for different situations, different uh, technologies that uh, need different things. So that's what, I, uh, that's what I regard as open standards. Open source is very close. Of course, it's, um, it's uh, but different. Uh, open source is, uh, those, if you want a definition, you can go, open, go to opensource.org. And you can find some definitions of open source. So, so, so open source software is software where, where you find, put it out, the software out there and just also make it available. If you're using it, you must be able to get the source. Uh, that means uh, if you are, for, even if I sell the, if, if I sell it to my customers, you must be able to get hold of the source, compile, compile it on your computer and do it yourself. Uh, I may have a license which will require you, if you change it, to do the same thing, or, or, or I might not, depending on the license. But open source, in fact, was very important for the web. So certainly everything, all, all the software that I've written has been open source. There were sort of original web browsers from CERN went out there, anybody could use it. Uh, there were parts of it people took and it out. I wrote one, the, I wrote a, it was a really cool browser, it was a browser editor. I was very pleased with it, but only ran on the next machine. Um, you know, who, who remembers the next? Okay. Yeah, a few, yes. Um, uh, above average. Uh, so the next remembrance we have in Soviet. Um, so, uh, but, you know, uh, cool though it was, uh, we really needed uh, uh, one of the platforms. In fact, various people, Mark, Mark, Mark and, and Jason famously, Mosaic and Netscape, uh, produced code. To, and, uh, but, but, but lots of other people, his was, I think, the fourth browser at Mosaic. It was Cello and Viola. And those and these people traded pieces of code, it's not just the specs, but also they, you know, it was this, uh, you could rip, rip out a piece of code out of somebody else's uh, somebody else's software if you thought that it did 
if it solved a problem that you had. So open source was important among the development community for getting this thing going. Open source was also important for the spread of this in the government community because uh, as I'm talking to somebody uh, after the web exploded, if you like, and has exploded through Washington, he said, yes, we're sitting at a desk in the, in the, in the US government. This software you could download, because it, it was free, you could uh, just download it and play with it and show everybody. And any other software that you installed in it, not being free, then they would have to go through a procurement cycle, which would have been a six-month cycle. They would have to write, you know, they wanted the web browser, they would have to write a, specific, a requirement specification for what the web browser should be able to do. And they would have had to put it out to a competitive tender. And that would have taken a ridiculous amount of time. That was not the time uh, that things were moving. Things were moving pretty fast then. People were talking about web use as being uh, going by 2.6, the rate to, uh, the one year is 2.6 web years. Things are going so fast, like dog years, sort of thing. And yeah, they were a very exciting time. Open source made everything run very much rapidly. And of course, the fact that the internet had been around for 20 years as a, as a platform on which you know, we had, there was, there was network news, which you probably uh, don't see very much of now, but it was pretty useful for getting out the, the, the news about the web. There was an email, of course, so we had, to put, we had those things. We had the basis of those. Uh, so that, that, that the internet platform was there for, for uh, spreading, this, spreading this stuff. So open source is important. Uh, I can talk for ages about open source. Um, if people do talk to uh, ages about open source, I think it's really important. I'd encourage you certain, uh, to get involved, in, whether you're acad in, uh, in academic or actually if you have a company. Lots of some great companies which, make their, which work by developing open source and selling to people. And selling, uh, you know, and renting it to people, and helping those people that they've rented to uh, use it, giving them extra service, but also allowing anybody who wants to compile it and take it for free to do that. All right. So now let's talk about open access. Open access is also uh, interesting, but it kind of uh, and it's kind of connected, but it's in a way sort of different. So open access is a term. Uh, some people. Some people use open access to mean to get access to the internet, right? but mostly the phrase open access is used with journals. Uh, and journal, the academic, the, the, the academic system, of the, when, the web, uh, when the web started to spread across the internet, was in this convention, you know, the, the original state in which you wrote papers and you submitted them to journals, uh, and you submitted them to conferences, and they were reviewed by your peers, and then afterwards, you, you, if you were, the paper was accepted, you maybe spoke at the conference, and after a while, you could get hold of the journal, and you'd be sent a copy of the journal, and you'd probably, and you, if you typically get people would get it, because they would go to their well, university library, and their big university would subscribe to all these journals, and they'd have them in racks on the walls. Uh, and some people would subscribe themselves, I subscribed for a bit to the communications of the, the ACM communications of hypertext, uh, which has some good uh, uh, editions. Uh, somebody actually made, uh, and, and later, a few years later, I found that somebody had made a beautiful bridge, a seat out of all their all their bound mm. copies <laughs> of communications of the ACM, uh, and, uh, and left it in the, in the lounge in the, the C cell at MIT, because things have changed so much. But now everybody just pulls things over the net. And the whole idea then, now when people pull things over the net, well, often they, they would send, you know, people would send around a copy of those papers to their friends and there'd be this sort of back channel. But uh, after a while, it became clear that the journal process was just taking too long to get stuff out there. Before the web, in fact, all more or less at the same time, there was a, there was a physics archive, which was an FTP, file transfer protocol site, which people would upload PDF copies, well, postscript copies in those days, of their paper, papers too. And that was, in fact, the way the physics community worked. That was just so much faster. That was where, that effectively worked as a sort of side channel journal. So anything that was published in a journal would be put up there. This, of course, journal publishers didn't like at all. And this led to a lot of discussion about whether the journal publishers were right. And in fact, information should be locked down. And you shouldn't read these things unless you could afford a subscription, or you were at a university which could afford a subscription. And more and more people are realizing that that's not a very good system. And one of the things that um, uh, motivates change, one of the things that motivate, motivated uh, Aaron Schwartz, who famously was uh, 
was involved in trying pushing for open access until, uh, until he died on the 11th of January. Uh, uh, is that there's a tremendous uh, unfairness that if you happen to be, it's fine if you're growing up uh, and you're going to a university which can afford to buy all the general subscriptions, but actually, if you're growing up in, uh, in Sub Saharan Africa and you have got internet access and you have got on online courseware, but that online courseware can't keep referring to, pay, to papers because you actually can't get, get access to them, then that's just the, the, that increases the unfairness in the world by an unacceptable amount. So the idea is that the knowledge out there should be free. There's another very strong argument that because actually the knowledge is produced by academics. And the academics are actually typically paid by governments. So a lot of, you know, a lot of research, a lot of the work is government funded, so it's been paid for. These journals are in fact, you know, the actual writing has been paid for out of government funds, and therefore it's reasonable to, to imagine that if that, the, um, that it should all be available for free. And so what's happening now, a lot of journals, if you look at the Nature website, so you can publish in two different ways. For some journals, you can either publish the conventional way, or you can find the cost up front uh, to get nature to commit to get uh, to give you a license to publish it anywhere and to make it free to anybody for all time. And that license costs a few thousand dollars. Uh, that's one way of doing it. Other people just think, okay, let's, we'll just put our own journal system together and we won't, we'll just do it all for free. Uh, we'll do it in our spare time. Uh, and we won't have a, we won't use a, uh, the conventional publisher. Uh, uh, will we, uh, if we do, but if we do that, if we end up having to employ somebody, we're not quite sure how we'll pay them, but maybe we'll ask for donations. So that is all up in the air. But I think one thing is clear, that the journal model, the old original model, where you can't get, uh, you can't get any, any journal uh, article until you pay a lot of money, is, uh, has had it. It's, uh, it's not going to be the one of the, of the future. So that's, uh, so uh, much for um, open access. Uh, um, I can talk about open government. Uh, people, people do talk about open government. It means a lot of different things. I'm going to talk about one particular thing more later on. Uh, it talk, it, a lot of it is people talk open government, meaning uh, trans the government is being transparent about what it's doing. That can be transparent about the process. It can be trans it can be that it puts data, and I'll talk a lot more about that under open data. Uh, data out there. Uh, some people by open government they mean uh, that you're using e-government, you're using it's a web-based government, government to citizen, G to C interfaces to make the government more efficient. So uh, and so, so that you end up with uh, the citizen feeling that they're able to participate uh, a lot, not just read stuff from the government, but interact and form the government where where things are wrong. So uh, more about it, open government. Uh, the data. Let me talk about, though, uh, going back towards the uh, uh, the things that are coming out of W3C. I'm going to talk about the open web platform. Now, the open web platform is uh, I talked about HTML, the uh, HTML, HTML5, the current version of HTML. There's something uh, significantly different about the new world that comes with the HTML5 compared to the old world which I produced when I originally invented the web. Originally the web was the, the idea of basically static documents. <coughs> they, 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 they'd be generated back in programs, so they might have dates in them, but basically the idea was quasi-static documents with links between them. And once you download a document, it would be, uh, it would have my particular links, but otherwise it would be just like a word wrote as a button. And it would have link, and, and you, you, the set of links would therefore be sort of at any moment in time, you can imagine that it was just a, a set of these things, and that was what the web was. Uh, and that was kind of a nice model. But as soon as the browser started allowing you to, when you build a web page, to stick a little program in there, which they did using a, a, a language called JavaScript, <coughs> or standardized ECMAScript, um, then suddenly a web page is something different. And with HTML5, that takes it to a logical conclusion where not only can you write a little program to go inside the that runs inside the web page to make to animate it and do cool things, you can actually write any program which you could write on a computer. So anything anything which as an app which you put on a phone or a tablet or a computer, you can now write as a web page. 
And the reason, there are two reasons why that is cool. It, one is that when you've written as a, what we call a web app, uh, you use the web technologies. You're using JavaScript, you're using a bunch of application program interfaces which are defined also at WTC. Uh, uh, you're using the things like uh, the style sheet languages, which have been around on the web for ages. You're using uh, HTML, and so you, which allows you to do little tags, like very easily put videos in your web pages and things like that. So you're, uh, you're developing using all the standards. And when you've done that, it runs on any browser. So therefore, because all platforms, all different types of phone, device, have browsers, that means that you can use it anywhere. And that is... Uh, and, it's, uh, and designing things as a web app compared to designing them as say, a phone app or a tablet app is also cool because it keeps them on the web. There was an article in Wired, in the UK version of Wired, I think, in which Chris Anderson said, uh, proposed that the web is dead, the web is dying. Uh, part of that was uh, nonsense about the fact that the internet is more and more taken up with bits of video, but that's, that's just, he does. That was a, a bad piece of logic. Yes, video is more, taking a more larger proportion of, of the web, of, of internet traffic, because video just takes a lot of traffic, because videos are very big. Uh, but the amount of, he was wrong to conclude that the amount of HTML was, was decreasing. But what he did say is the other problem is <clears throat> that people are building apps. They're taking, in, so if somebody designs an app, and it's just a phone app, it's not a web app, then as if I'm browsing through your magazine, say, and I find on page 13 of your, of your magazine app a really cool something I want to talk about, something I want to tell my friends about, it's not on the web. It doesn't have the URL at the top. I can't bookmark it. I can't send you that bookmark. I can't tweet it. I can't email it. I can't bring it into the con con uh, conversation. I can't like it. I can't dislike it. So it's, you know, it's off the web. Stuff that's on the web is part of the discourse. The reason why the web is exciting is it's full of chatting and it's full of people discussing, which is good. People making lists of really good things and people, other people making lists of really good things from their point of view. And all of those, all that list making drives, in fact, the search engines, which use all those links to figure out what things they should put up at the top of the queue. So there's this massive part of machinery all driven by people trying desperately to express what they think is important out there. And if you build a if, if you build something which is just a native app, then you're out of that. You're off out of the universal discourse. You're out of, you're out of um, the. Uh, you, you're out of the sort of the social medium, and therefore you're a loss. And so that's why, if somebody comes to you and asks you to build a native app, you should ask and say, "Are you sure you you're going to build a web app?" <coughs> Explain to them why. And uh, that HTML5 with all the pieces we call the open web platform. So that is the open web platform. Now, of course, when people talk about open platforms, there's another thing which immediately gets, uh, immediately, uh, uh, which is very similar. Where which is, people use the same, similar, similar words when they're talking about open platforms in the sense of when I, got, when I buy my phone, can I install any app on it? In fact, there are a few questions that people. Uh, there's, there's a recent EFF, the uh, Electronic Freedom Foundation, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF.org blog anyway, just mentioned that the US law has, has changed slightly about what sort of things you can put in jail for. And some of the, uh, some of the questions that people ask in the States uh, is, for example, if I, have a, uh, if I buy a phone, can I run, install any program I want on it? Obviously, some phones you can and some you can't. Uh, they want to know, and now, or they also want to know, if I buy, buy a phone, can I use it with any plan? If I buy a plan, can I use it with any phone? That's, so that's another way in which people use the same openness of the phone platform. Can I, is it bound to the plan? And different countries have different rules about that. It's the sort of thing you can think about, and, uh, and you can change. Um, so, uh, that, uh, but uh, the, the first of all those, the first is, in fact, really interesting in some ways. Well, so I suppose partly as a game, partly as somebody who, who programs, I really appreciate that this thing, I can, pro I can program. 
sometimes some of the programs I use here, uh, I've, I came with it. Some of them, other people wrote and I installed. Some of them I wrote. But basically, if I am frustrated with this box, I want to do something else, because I can program, I can do it. In a way, sometimes I think there are two digital divides. There's a digital divide we all know about between the people who do not have web access and people who do have web access, which is a massive the digital divide, and it's been getting better, because we're getting bigger every time we make the technology more sophisticated. Uh, and there's a digital divide between the people who can program and the people who can't. My parents were some of the first people ever could, who could program. Uh, when I was in utero, my mother was, uh, was programming the first com uh, computer, rumored to be the first computer sold commercially. And that's a Franti Mark I, uh, which was uh, developed at Manchester University. And, uh, so they were all full of the fact, the excitement about computers, of the fact that because you know, the, the, what Turing's work showed was that basically all computers that have sufficient power and to, once a computer is a computer, it can emulate other computers, so all computers can do the same thing. And I think if you have a computer uh, which does something, and I have another computer, I can always write a program that pretends to be your computer and then runs that program. Therefore, any computer can run any program. And so, there's this huge set of programs which one could write, you could imagine. And therefore, when you look at a, comu a computer, it is up to you. It is only up to your imagination. And a few, a few, there are a few mathematical constraints, but it's only up to your imagination uh, as to what it can do. Uh, uh, and certainly, uh, so for me, the ability to be, to be able to do a program is really important. Curry Doctorow wrote, um, if you Google for his blog, on the war for general, general computation, points out, well, there's a big battle for the ability to program something. If you, uh, of the computers you have in your house, a lot of them you don't expect to program, like the computers in the fridge, typically you don't expect to program, you just use, you, you use those as appliances. A lot of kids nowadays, when they get a, computer, a laptop, they seem to treat it as an appliance. They open it, they close it, it's white goods, they, you know, if it doesn't work, then they ask for somebody to fix it. If, uh, they open, if they open it, it doesn't have enough, it's, you know, it has some things in it, if that doesn't have enough, you restock it, you buy stuff for it, you fill it with more music. But basically, the idea that you could actually change it yourself to go and do something else is not part of their education. And even there's some courses, you know, computing courses, which don't uh, really talk, teach anything in computer science. They just explain to you how to use this thing like a refrigerator. Uh, so, but on the other hand, if uh, the, the, a lot of teams do, however, know the difference between a computer where they can download whatever they want and something like a game console where they can't. So they realize that there are all kinds of things which sometimes break the law and sometimes don't, which they can download. And they have a moral decision as to whether to download something which does music sharing or something onto their machine. But they do have the ability to make the box do all kinds of things. And some of them learn to program. So there's this, um, so there's a certain number of so hold up, hold up, hold up your hand if you have ever programmed a computer in any language at all. Yeah, we have, we have. Uh, we have a large proportion of uh, that, that <coughs> on the geek side of the uh, back to the right here. So you understand that and you probably have sort of inherently just feel much more comfortable with something that you know that you can store things on. You understand the difference. The worry is that a lot of people out there won't understand the difference. And what uh, Cory Doctorow was pointing out was that there are a bunch of companies who would love to have total control of that. They would love to be able to lock it down so that only you can only run the applications which they have, uh, which, which they allow, which they let into their application store, for, for example, that's a tremendous commercial control. Obviously, you know, all the, all the closed platforms out there, you know the closed platforms, the closed phones, where you can only download apps from the app store. Uh, those apps, if they charge you money for something like baseball tickets or something, the, then something like 30% of the money for the baseball tickets you're buying using the app goes to the person who manufactured the phone. You know, what's wrong with this picture? So obviously, obviously open markets work better with, 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 with open platforms. But, there's, uh, but, uh, but the argument that a lot of people will use coming up is that if, we, if you let us lock down this device, if we, the next set of laptops, in fact, are locked down so that people can only install things that we, where we give them permission, then that would be so much better for security because they will be downloading all kinds of junk. 
vir uh, viruses and so on. And there's a certain amount of, amount of logic to that. You don't get so many uh, viruses on things, on the lockdown systems like, game, like the game consoles and so on. So open platform is another big discussion out there. But why don't we talk, talk about open data? Because uh, I spent uh, much more time, I suppose, talking about open data than any of these other uh, <coughs> type, uh, types of open source recently. Data, uh, I, I mentioned I would talk about this when we talk about governments. Government data is one of the sorts of data. 2009, from my personal point of view, when I uh, was some of you, I was looking at the year ahead. And I thought, what am I going to do in 2009? And I decided that I would make it a year of getting the people to put data on the web. Because they'd already put documents on the web, and they seemed to know how to do that. And they were doing all kinds of things with documents on the web and with, uh, and with web applications, but there was this missing data. And there was a big frustration that a lot of things that you found, for example, often in government -backed websites, but also commercial ones, that you'd be looking through cars that you could buy on the car manufacturer's website, or a dealer's website, and clearly behind it was a database of all the cars that were available to be test driven in, uh, across America. And in fact, there's one database for, the, for, for Toyota and there's another database for Volkswagen. And if I could pull them both together, then I could figure out where I could test drive the things I'm interested in. But I want to be able to look at, compare the, the, the Volkswagen data and the Toyota data. And I don't have access to the data. Lots of times when this is very, very frustrating. And so I started uh, persuading people to put data on the web. Some people, of course, were already doing it. I got the TED were kind enough to let me have the stage for 18 minutes, as they do in TED. Uh, so I got the chance to, to, to jump up and down about uh, open, open data there. Uh, Gordon Brown was uh, uh, Prime Minister of UK at that time. And he just said, yeah, we'll put the UK open government data, well, government data on the web. Let's do it. And that led to a short six-month project run by the Cabinet Office, which is more or less under uh, fairly close control of the Prime Minister, and then uh, and with a lot of support from various other government departments. And then the, sort of the, uh, the UK then leapt into this open government data. I understand that uh, it's cool, uh, New Zealand has got quite a lot of interesting uh, government data. In particular, what UK, or what the New Zealand has done, which the UK has not completely managed to do, is to have uh, open geospatial data, which lot, I've heard a lot of people <coughs> since I've been here being, very, uh, being just to totally enthusiastic about the fact that whatever you have, whatever data you have in New Zealand, you can put it on a map and you can release that map for free without, any, without having to put a little, uh, warn people that it's actually the map is actually copyright. Uh, is, uh, is great. The UK Ordnance Survey did release a lot of data. They, they released one particular layer. They didn't release, uh, release the master, uh, the master uh, data <coughs> base after which it's all generated, nor did they release the popular land range of the, sort of the 150,000, 125,000 maps. But, uh, but, uh, but, there is, but of course there is OpenStreetMap. Who here has contributed to OpenStreetMap? Yes. All right, normally that is. Uh, OpenStreetMap, for those who don't know it, is just like a map, but it's also a wiki. So that if you go somewhere and you find that the path you were following peters out into a cliff, you can take the, get out your, your, turn on your GPS app on your phone, go home, and then uh, and upload the GPS track to the OpenStreetMap and, uh, and push it in there. So that's an exciting type of open data. Geospatial data, of course, is very fun and exciting. Just maps have a natural appeal to some part of the brain that gives us a lot of good, good, good drugs. I think when we, when we look at maps, there's just a lot of people, number of people who you can look at, you show them tables all day long, you show them a map that ah, they sort of lock into it, and all the navigation systems in their brain start turning on. And, uh, uh, they can just look at the data much more effectively. Open government data, I would say, I point out there's three important reasons for making open government data. Um, what is just economic benefit? Your country will run much better. And any, anybody who's trying to run a business in that country will find life better if they can just print off maps, if they can create maps, 
if they can merge, if they can take government data about where all hospitals are, or where all the potholes in the road are, or uh, whatever, and just use it. They're running an insurance company, and they want to just pull in the areas liable to flooding, the earthquakes, and so on. That just makes life everything on easier. Problem is really difficult to measure because each person who's doing business, everybody who's using, uh, I know, so many people in different walks of life find themselves using the data indirectly or directly uh, in little ways. Uh, just as you, you know, when you use, say, maps uh, on, on your phone, how can you measure? Very, very hard to measure your channel investment because what you're doing is you're creating a public good which just, at the grassroots, just puts in lots and lots of fertilizer and it's very difficult to measure the total amount of benefit. Of benefit. But in general, it's, uh, it's huge. Typically, uh, it's orders of magnitude above the, the actual cost of collecting the data, certainly for geospatial data. So one is economic benefit. Another one is that it's really valuable for making, uh, uh, it's part of the process of making your government interact better, of e-government. And, the other, and the, the other one, which I put third, uh, because a lot of people put it first, is transparency. Of course, a government gets a lot of, uh, is trusted a lot more if it divulges its spending. UK government, all the spending down to, I think, £500 is out there. The, there was a big database uh, uh, put out there by the Treasury, which just had all, the, had all that spending data. It was made public. There was, a, there was a sort of filter ran over it to make sure there was a detailed Ministry of Defence spending, um, you know, which, would be, uh, which would be a threat to national security and a uh, few other things that were uh, some, a few other sorts of put on, but otherwise the spending is all there. Somebody blogged, the moment it was out there, that they said, look, that's a massive unintelligible data. <laughs> that's, that's, the, how hopeless it is to pre present everybody with this massive unintelligible data. Uh, it, it just makes, this, this, uh, makes the whole thing worse because before people didn't know, but now they're just confused. <laughs> <laughs> 24 hours later, the, uh, I was at the Guardian, uh, newspapers had these, these sites popped up saying, okay, this is um, this, how they spend your money. Government spending. And showing you simply from the top down, this is you know, for the top level, this is where it goes. Click on each of these and you can, you, you can drill down beautiful, really easy to use interfaces that you can, you know, you can use if you're a middle school teaching kids. Uh, so, uh, it demonstrated that one of the things, one of the ways government data, open government data works is that the government just puts the data out there and then lots of other people then use it. So, there is, so transparency is part of the uh, uh, the reason for open government the important but for me the biggest uh, the, the, the biggest reason for it is uh, the economic benefit. Okay, so the so the one thing I want to finish with because I imagine that everything I've told you is just going to go in one ear and out the other. But I want one thing I'm going to say last. I want to just say, and that's about what some people call the open web or people call the open. Alright, yes, and the last word of the way where we use the word uh, open is that when you uh, when you use the internet, when you when I go onto the web, I've paid to connect to the internet. You've paid to connect. Suppose we pay to connect at the same we pay the same similar sort of amount, we connect at the same rate. We should be able to communicate, no matter who you are and I am. And that's how the internet was built, and that's how that's why you can go follow links to any old website out there. So that openness, that's we call that partly net neutrality. Net neutrality is about the fact that the net does not have an attitude. The net does not type one you to is not telling you where to buy your shoes. It's not telling you which party to vote for. It's not discriminating. This non-discriminating nature of the web. So you know that the, uh, the internet service providers do all kinds of things inside the network. When there's too much traffic, they cut down on video or they cut down on they may make your sound more choppy, they will make your web page load, they, they do traffic chasing, they do all kinds of things but they can, in order to make the internet run. They do that in very clever ways, but they must not do it with a commercial incentive. They must not slow down the traffic to their competitors' movie websites in order to sell you their own movies. 
They must not slow down the traffic to a particular politician's website because they would prefer you to find out more easily about a different politician that's a different candidate for the same election. If companies or governments get to control the internet, then they destroy it. As they destroy it as the foundation for the way individual people find out about the world. They find destroy it as the basis for education. If, they, uh, if individual uh, uh, obviously, uh, in a democratic world, it, it, individuals must be informed. The informed electorate is crucial. And you must not allow governments or companies to twist, to put a filter, put a pink spectacles over the vision people have when they look at the web. So blocking, arbitrary blocking, um, uh, and delivery of packets with discrimination is not allowed, it's against the principle of net neutrality, net neutrality is very important. And of course, in a way, or worse, the other thing that they can do is spy on you. Spy on you and keep that information, or spy on you and use that information, depending on which country you're in, depending on which company it is, sometimes they may spy on you in order to be able to target you with particular advertising, or they may be targeting on you, target you to find out, to trace the social networks that you're part of, and put you and all your friends in jail, and possibly kill you. So, Spying, no. Blocking, no. In some cases, yes. You know, we, governments have to do things in order to counter terrorism. They need to do things to counter serious organized crime. But if you do that, you have to do it extremely carefully. You have to not accumulate data about individual people, who, uh, about individual citizens, because that data could be used for blackmail, it's effectively dynamite, it's very dangerous. So no blocking, no spying. That the open internet is what the whole idea of the web is based on. It's what nowadays a lot of our society is based on. Well, people assume it until the Mubarak regime turned it off in Egypt. They assumed that it was just like air and water, and it's not. Somebody somewhere can turn out off your internet, find out who it is, and make sure that in future, with all the laws that you pass, you never allow, in whatever country you are, you never allow the government, however nice the government you think they are at the moment, you never set up the precedent that governments or large companies can block or spy on the internet. And that is the most important of all the opens, that is the open uh, internet, that's net neutrality. Thank you very much. Consumers' point of view, there is no uh, 
there is no uh, discrimination. Uh, then what happens inside, particularly between different ISPs, then uh, I may not follow the, or, or the question, but what happens inside between different ISPs, for example, the, the, the ways, the, all the, the, the uh, contracts, the way the contracts are drawn between different ISPs, the distribution uh, so that uh, the money which is paid by people at the edge of the network gets fed appropriately into the people who actually have to, for example, do a piece of the backbone, back do the international connections, and so on, is hairy. And it, it's very, very complex. And yes, you're right. And uh, it's uh, so, um, in fact, but the fact that it's complica complicated and hairy, I think, means, does not mean that the, some, it, it, it should, that the principle shouldn't be solved. In other words, so if, you're, if, you're, if, you're not, if you notice that you're, 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 you're a big backbone and you see a lot of that stuff going by as Netflix, and you think, boy, if it wasn't for Netflix, life would be easier. Let's charge, charge net, let's threaten to chop up Netflix, or if unless they give us the money, no. No, the money from Netflix has to come through the system, and you've got to find a way of just making, you know, making the, and I know it's difficult and complicated, but we have to find ways of getting the agreements between the ISPs to work out mathematically so the motivations are all, uh, are all there, so that neutrality is preserved. You've got to find a way that if, that if you have somebody who produces, that is marketing millions and millions of movies a night, uh, and one person who's marketing a, 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 another movie, the, the costs that they bear are sort of millions, millions, millions and millions to one, but they are reasonable, and, uh, and so that you have a reasonable market between these, you know, the, 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 the massive, between Hollywood and between the independent film producers. So tell me, I expect most of us here know the Aaron Swartz and Dot Com Raid stories. This, the former demonstrates the chilling effects that can occur when representatives of the government react to curiosity and old school hacking with fear and suspicion. The latter shows that the reach of the US government can extend even to us here in New Zealand. What can we do as citizens of a small country do about any of this? Lots. <laughs> you, can, uh, for, uh, you can do things internally. So for example, you can declare principles under which you will operate so that when a judge is wondering whether to allow uh, an investigation to come on or to allow information to be uh, snooped, by, uh, uh, that there are principles out, out there which you have decided on, uh, <clears throat> which you have incorporated within, within your own laws, so that if somebody from outside tries to impose their law by the, through a negotiation, through treaty, uh, uh, or for, for example, you, can, you have a way of, you have a, uh, a way of uh, looking at them and you have a benchmark against which to see whether they actually meet your criteria. You can do things like, you can make sure that sort of thing doesn't happen in New Zealand. And guess what? The US government's reach does extend outside the, the USA. Your reach extends outside the borders of New Zealand too. It's okay. You can sign petitions for President Obama to change the law. They're out there. Okay, there are present uh, lots of petitions about uh, Aaron Schwartz suggesting that the people who did the prose prosecutions should maybe find uh, work somewhere else. Uh, uh, and so. Uh, uh, there will be, so yes, and to a certain extent, a lot of people are starting to realize that because the, the US law affects a lot of people, one way or another, that actually you know, Europe, a lot of Europeans have actually started to realize that they can have opinions about it. And a lot of those, even look at the tweets about Aaron Schwartz, they're not just from America. So, uh, so, um, so yes, you can take part in the outcry about what happened with the US law, help people. Uh, encourage people to, uh, in the US to change that law. That's obviously, you know, there's already an Aaron, Aaron's law have been, have been proposed that may have to be strengthened, but, uh, maybe, but that's uh, <coughs> already something uh, uh, important. Uh, but also, I think you can, in a country this size, you can achieve things. It's in a way, I noticed with the UK, it was easy to get open government data going than in the US, it seemed, because you could get you know, all the people, uh, a certain number of people around a, ta uh, a table and they'd have a certain cloud and you could do things. And you'd certainly find that with small companies. 
with smaller countries. So you can draw, if you draw up, like Brazil has drawn up a set of internet, a, a set of principles, the internet which they're trying to make uh, a, a, about open, the you know, open internet, which they tried to get through Parliament. Through the, through, through the parliament. Uh, so you, know, you can do that now, you, here, and you can be a leader. And when you do it, hey, you know, the Australians, they do it. And then after they do it, the Australians do it, and everybody might realize that it's uh, actually not going to be so hard. But in fact, it's good for business, uh, it's, uh, and it hasn't uh, opened up a country to, to cyber attack. to suggest that uh, we've heard um, an exciting lecture, but that's the end point, I think, was actually the, the most exciting part of it was the point that, yes, uh, borders flow in both directions, and information flows in both directions, and although the rest of the world, particularly the United States of America, has an enormous effect on New Zealand, we have a reciprocal effect on the rest of the world. Thank you very much for that thought. Will you please join with me in thanking Sir Tim Berners-Lee for uh, the best definition, the most comprehensive definition of openness that we can possibly expect to hear. Thank you.